So welcome back, and we'd like to uh, begin this afternoon by thanking one of our sponsors, and he's going to have a few words from us, uh, from him, to uh, about the participation in NACID, and we're really grateful for his support. So if we could ask Brian Schaefer from Drager to come up. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate it. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm Brian Schaffer from Drager, and uh, we could not be more proud to be here at NACID uh, during this kickoff. So uh, Drager's been around since 1889. We've been in uh, the U.S. continuously since 1907. We started in the breath alcohol detection world in the 1950s with a little tiny glass tube that had potassium dichromate in it that would uh, detect uh, the presence of alcohol in certain concentrations. We started with oral fluid uh, testing technology in the early 2000s, and so we have a very unique view. We, we have a broad portfolio from ignition interlock devices to evidential breath testing and now to oral fluid drug testing. And so we have this great view and great appreciation for what NACID brings to multi-substance uh, detection in particular, but uh, but we want to identify uh, impairment. And so that's what makes this uh, particular session so exciting. I've uh, been in sessions from, uh, with most of these speakers before, and you're going to really enjoy them. Uh, but I just want to say that NACID has the ability uh, to immediately have an impact that's really been missing uh, on the national level uh, and, and, frankly, international level that there will be an impact uh, right away from bringing these stakeholders together. And I just want to thank, um, uh, thank them for, for doing the hard work, and we could not be more proud to be a partner with you. So uh, with that, I just want to say a quick thing. Um, integrity is the thing that, that you do uh, when nobody's watching. And I was uh, on the other side of the street from Darren yesterday, and I saw him waiting at a crosswalk, and it said, don't walk. And it's a Washington, D.C. intersection, so it had about 12 different lanes going in different directions. And Darren did not walk. <laughs> so uh, I just want to tell you, that's the kind of man who leads NACID. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. We really appreciate uh, Drager's support for this, this gathering and for NACID. And we invite all of you to check out their table in the, in the hallway on the next break. With that, um, we're going to call back to the stage Darren Grandolf, who will talk about our session on countermeasures, where we're going to talk about issues of detection. And joining him will be the panelist Deputy Chief Matt Myers with the Peachtree Georgia Police Department, Kurt Harper with the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences, Jennifer Davidson from NHTSA, and Jamie, Officer Jamie Derbyshire from Montgomery County, Maryland Police Department. Thank you. So thank you for all coming back. Uh, we know that a lot of the material that we're going to cover, it's, there's a lot of information. Um, I know by the end of the day, my head hurts. So we know that there's a lot of condensed information in that. And so grateful that you came back from our break here for uh, our countermeasures detection um, session here. So I am not going to belabor this, but I'm going to turn on a time over to uh, our assistant chief, Matt Myers from Peachtree City. Uh, thanks, Darren. Appreciate you having me up. So uh, I'm not going to do a lot of the introduction type stuff, but just by um, short, short introduction. My name is Matt Myers. He said I'm Assistant Chief with Peachtree City, Georgia Police Department, but I'm also a, a longtime drug recognition expert and past chair of the DRE section of IACP. And uh, with the IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, I also participate in a couple other important programs. The, uh, the Highway Safety Committee, uh, many of which we have the uh, here in the room, most of that panel is probably here, as well as a technical advisory panel. And we work together uh, as different elements to support the DRE program, the A-RIDE training, uh, and all of these different great things we're talking about that come from, through a lot of great cooperative efforts from, uh, from NHTSA uh, and ICP and all of our other partners. Uh, so that's just my, my quick introduction of the kind of the angle I'm coming from. And my topic, of course, is just a little bit about law enforcement uh, training and deployment as a countermeasure. And you know we've had a lot of good speakers already today. Uh, I guess fortunately or unfortunately, se several several of my key points have kind of already been hit on. So I don't want to try and be redundant. So I've changed it up a little bit on the fly, on the way I'm going to approach some of these, and hopefully we'll just end up with some good dialogue that maybe I can just uh, I can cue into a few key points. 
Now, I expect a lot of people probably think that we, you know, you let a cop get up here and talk, and I'm just going to tell you we need uh, more money to train more officers to arrest more bad guys. Uh, it, you know, it's really not nearly that simple. Uh, we have to be very at grips with the fact that we are never going to arrest our way out of the problem. It simply is not going to happen. There's not a certain number of people I can arrest for DUI, and all of a sudden it stops being an issue. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, and we have to remember that what we want to get to is voluntary compliance, and to get voluntary compliance, you know, unfortunately, with certain people uh, and with certain violations in particular, it has to result from deterrence. Now, I would like to say that that's not the case, but it is. And let me kind of explain by way of how I look at it coming from a law enforcement officer and also as a parent, which may seem a little unorthodox, but I've got four kids. Uh, they're all pretty young. I got a 10 year old, uh, one that turned eight today, and I got twin four year old girls, right? So I got four kids and I really would like to think that I'm gonna be a great parent. I'm gonna set these great values and instill in them uh, the, the right decisions and doing the right things for the right reasons. You know, so they're gonna see these moral and ethical obligations and they're just gonna do it because it's the right thing to do. And sometimes that's true, but what kind of compliance I get from them is, is gonna change a lot, depending upon things like you know, their age, their maturity, their viewpoint on something, peer influences, what their personal needs are. And at, at their core values, you know, things are really important. I'm probably gonna get good compliance on. The things that they maybe value a little differently or a little less than I do, if I'm gonna get compliance there, they have to be concerned that there's gonna be some discipline. Uh, if, if you've got kids in the room, you know what I'm saying. There's some things they're going to do because it's the right thing, and some things they're only going to do if you, if you threaten some kind of discipline. And aren't we all like that a little bit? I, I think we all grow up and we stay that way. Just what we're like that about is different. So most of us, we're probably not going to steal. You're, you're not, you're not going to kill somebody. These, these are things we're probably not going to do, not just because of the threat of arrest or incarceration, but because it's not the right thing to do. But how are you doing with the speed limit? It's a crosswalk, you know? We're not, we're not all like Darren, you know? So that, that's, that's a, a whole different topic. You know, if you're obeying the speed limit, are you really doing it because that's, it's in your heart, that's the right thing to do, or are you a little bit worried about getting a ticket? I'm gonna tell you, you know, sometimes I find myself, you know, hit the brakes, like, ooh, man, there's it's probably a cop up here, you know? Uh, it, we gotta have some deterrence because not everybody's going to value all the different kinds of violations. So it, it's necessary, it's not an ends itself arresting people, but it is, absolutely necessary because not all of society is going to agree with us you shouldn't drive while impaired. They're not going to agree that they are impaired. We're not going to agree that, uh, you know, taking these different drugs together is going to create an impairment and they're going to go out and do it. Uh, we, we are never in the near future, I'm not going to say never, we're in the near future. I don't see us getting to a point where we have so completely changed the culture that everybody's going to give us voluntary compliance on this and we don't have to worry about it anymore. I do hope we see that. But until then, it's my job to make sure people are at least, to a, to a reasonable extent, afraid to go out and drive impaired because they're going to be arrested. And so that's why it's important. We have to have the element of deterrence because there is no fear of arrest unless there's an actual risk of arrest. And where do we see that fail changes a little bit depending upon the scenario. Most officers are fairly well trained to detect intoxication by alcohol alone. Uh, I think all 50 states have something required in basic law enforcement uh, academy we'll get some at least baseline familiarization with that. Uh, it's also very common to take another class after that, the basic DUI detection and standardized field sobriety testing. We'll train them a little bit better, give them some better tools on that. But after that, it, 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 there's a lot of variability. The next training after that, you heard A-Ride, Advanced Roadside Impaired Driving Enforcement, referred to earlier. Some places it's great. We get, you know, agencies require that training for all their entire department. Uh, some places not so much. But those, those training programs are important to us because they will help us prevent some of these failures. The failures that in, in terms of multi-substance impairment occur when we have things like uh, you know, non-alcohol drugs. I think that's been discussed a lot. We have impairment by drugs other than alcohol. The officers maybe lack you know, their, their decision point to get into the process, right? So uh, for, for that officer, the process looks like this. You know, they, they detect a person they think might be, uh, they might be impaired. They'll, they'll put them on the roadside. Uh, they'll get them out of the car, maybe. They'll have that conversation. They'll conduct some evaluations. They'll decide if they think they're impaired. If they are, they'll go ahead and arrest them. And then the rest of the, the, rest of the case is going to proceed through based upon their ability to articulate that decision in a clear and convincing manner, right? So there can be failures at all of these points. And with those drugs other than alcohol, it occurs very early often. And it's a major factor of how they are trained. Right? So if they are not confident in what they've detected, so they see some abnormal behaviors, but they don't smell alcohol, 
and the person denies drug use, are they confident enough to put handcuffs on this person and take them to jail and charge them accordingly? And let's just say they are. Can they explain that in a clear and convincing manner to a judge or jury? That's where we, that's where we see a lot of failure start. And then it's further complicated when we have things like a low alcohol concentration plus drugs. So we have a person who's maybe a 0.04, but he's also taken a good bit of Xanax today. This person looks like they're extremely intoxicated. We get that breath test, see that 0.04, and it's like, oof, man, maybe I was wrong. Maybe we unarrest that guy. If you, do, if you do arrest him and you put him through, are you gonna be able to articulate why this was something other than a person who just can't handle their alcohol? There's major problems that, that start stacking up there. Polytherapy cases are what we, you know, is a term you hear sometimes, meaning people that are taking several different therapeutics stacked on top of each other. And how does that look for the officer? So we have a person, if they're taking these several different medications combined together, there's probably some sort of underlying disease state as well that may have its own uh, ways that it influences behavior. The officer has to segregate out what's going on with this person. Is the change in behaviors that I'm seeing, a, a, is it because of the drugs? Is it because of, you know, this combination of drugs? Is it really complicated by whatever got them here in the first place? That can be a hard decision. And let's just say they do make that decision again. They have to go to court and explain in a convincing manner to a jury who's also taking prescription medications for their medical problems that what was going on with this person was some deviation from a reasonable degree of care that is going to make them criminally liable for it. How can you articulate that? How can you articulate the confidence that it was the drugs, not the disease they had in the first place or some other combination of factors because they were nervous about what's the contact with law enforcement or whatever else is happening today. Fortunately, we do have pretty good training to help with these things. We have the ARAD and DRE training, it's great, uh, but there are, there are limitations in how we are supporting them. Let me just talk first real quick about where we're coming from over the last few years. So if you look in the top left corner here at this diagram, this is just showing us uh, that over the last few years, obviously 2020 was a little bit of an anomaly. It was very challenging with COVID. Uh, our numbers were down, but prior to that, we were averaging about 15,000 officers per, train, uh, per year trained in the United States on a ride. And we were averaging about 15 or 1600 new DREs per year. Now, it's really hard to, especially in a nutshell, make something out of what that really is in context of about 800,000 officers in the United States. Uh, so I'm gonna reduce it down to one, what I think is a pretty illustrative statistic, and that's that there are about 2,872 agencies uh, with a DRE. That's only about 15% of the law enforcement agencies in the United States. And I think that should speak to you. Only about 15% of agencies in the United States have at least one DRE. So right there is, is one of the limitations, the scope. What, what, what percentage of the geographic United States does that represent? That's something I couldn't possibly extrapolate out, but we can see there's a large amount of the population, there's a large amount of the law enforcement out there without the resource. Uh, a quick look at some statistics just from the year 2020. There were about 8,000 certified DREs in the United States. Uh, there were about, again, 2,800 agencies with DREs, and they conducted about 26,000 enforcement evaluations. Uh, now, what does that translate to in terms of multi-substance impairment? Just about 42% of them were two or more drug categories. I couldn't break the data out by multiple drugs. I had to break it out by drug categories. So if somebody was using alcohol and Xanax, for example, those are both depressants. Uh, and that would be one category. But if it's alcohol and um, marijuana, for example, that's two categories. But you see there's a pretty significant number. I'm not gonna keep going on about that. I wanna move on to challenges, but if you want more information about those programs, please hit up the Drug Evaluation and Classification Program website at decp.org. So what are the challenges? And I'm gonna say we have uh, an iceberg problem. And, and I think that's kind of a, uh, actually Christine Frank kind of, kind of got me started on that. I think it's a really interesting way to look uh, at the problem and, it, and it's a theme that I see throughout the different areas where we have challenges. And the first one, this could be a whole eight hour discussion or more itself, but just in a nutshell, we have a major issue with cultural devaluation of traffic enforcement. And we've heard a little bit about that discussed today, but we see there's no shortage of news stories out there about a city or a county or whatever who is uh, nearly or completely stopping traffic enforcement or another city that's you know, con you know, contemplating doing it all by automated enforcement or replacing law enforcement officers with uh, you know, perhaps non-certified type, um, I don't know, traffic ambassadors or whatever we'd like to call them. So there's a lot of de-emphasis uh, going on out there right now. And it's at a particularly dangerous time when we have a huge increase in use of multiple drugs and drugs in, uh, in addition to alcohol in general. Appropriate allocation of funding. Uh, 
and, and I guess I should connect the, the tip of the iceberg analogy there for you on the cultural one before I get to the next one. The problem is that when we devalue uh, traffic enforcement, when we say that, um, you know, we're going to stop this operation, we're going to de-emphasize this operation, it's usually predicated upon the idea that traffic enforcement is something that is related to going out and speeding tickets and expired tags and stuff like that. That, that is a very, very, very small slice of the pie, right? So just like we talked about when I started off, we have to have this, this element of deterrence and voluntary compliance. We have to, we, we need the officers out there making arrests for things like driving under the influence, first of all, to stop that one threat, but also to deter the other ones. We have to be out there to reduce all those other violations, all those other problems that are occurring beneath the surface. Uh, and we've seen repeatedly that that is necessary to make major change. I'll come back to that perhaps in a minute if we have time. So allocation of funding, you know, there's, I gotta say NHTSA has done a great job as well as some of these other uh, partners like uh, responsibility.org, AAA. We have a number of partners who've done a great job helping us get funding for, for key needs like training of officers. And that's, and that's great. We really, we really are appreciative of that in the law enforcement community. But what I see is that funding is often done looking only at the tip of the iceberg. Again, it's, it's really easy to say, hey, you know what we should do? We should fund more training of officers. Here's you know, thousands of dollars, go train more officers. I may not be able to train more officers, okay? It, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Are we taking care of the program we've got and the officers we've already trained? Are we doing the right things to provide the research basis to continue the program? Are we doing the right things to build continuing training for the officers we've already trained? Can I logistically implement whatever new training you've said you're going to give me money for? Maybe not. Do we have the infrastructure to do it? There's a lot of challenges there, and it's not always easy. Lacking leadership in law enforcement specifically. Now, I mean, I could, we could go on and on about leadership in different aspects of the culture or politics and things like that. But just within law enforcement, and this is very disappointing, we have a huge lack of leadership on traffic enforcement at the executive le levels. We have a lot of police chiefs and sheriffs and uh, you know, our, our top administrators who devalue traffic enforcement, and it's getting worse continually. It already was not a priority because, you know what, it doesn't, that's not what keeps their jobs. That's not what the city manager asks them about. That's not what the city council asks about. That's not what the newspaper writes about. Nobody cares until it's a thing, and it's not a thing for most people very often. They care about how many part one crimes did you have. Most people don't know what a part one crime is, but that's all I ever get asked about, right? So. It's not a priority for a lot of police chiefs because that's not what keeps their paycheck coming every two weeks. And honestly, I'm gonna tell you, from my perspective, that's where they get more grief about than anything else. If I'm gonna get a, a weird phone call from a citizen, from an upset city councilman, from something, it's probably about traffic because somebody got a ticket and why do we always have somebody out uh, writing so many tickets in a particular area? I'm gonna skip forward because uh, I think I'm running out of time, so. The, the last one there, although I can explain a little more on that one, uh, is well-supported laboratories. That's a little bit of a challenge because uh, we need the laboratories to be able to have a, a, a broad scope of testing and support the findings in order to maintain uh, continuity of the program and expansion of the program. If it constantly looks like bad decisions are being made, that, that, that's an issue. So my real quick uh, solutions, uh, first of all, for the, you know, our, our leadership hopefully in changing cultural norms, we need to use um, and there's different approaches to this, but we need data-driven, legitimate leadership in this area. We need chiefs that can be, talk and, and command staff that can talk to relevant people in the community and your people that are making decisions about staffing and funding of police departments. Why is it an issue? What, 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 what are my actual high crash areas? What are my high crash contributors? How am I deploying personnel to combat that problem? What, you know, am I writing a lot of tickets? Am I writing a lot of warnings? What are they for? You know, being able to say things like, okay, well, these are my top crash locations. I'm deploying people in this manner uh, for this reason. These are my top violations. And making that have legitimacy with the community is vitally important. And I found that when I can have those conversations almost without exception, people buy in immediately. Allocation of funding, there are experts to ask about this. So if you're a part of an organization who wants to help, Ask the right people what to do about it. Don't just throw money at what you think is an issue. The technical advisory panel to IACP is a group of great experts who will, I shouldn't speak for the, the IACP staff, but will probably take your questions and take them to the panel to get answers. The Highway Safety Committee, the chair's right here in the room. We have a lot of great highway safety uh, personnel that can help with questions about what priority areas are. 
So those are major issues that we need to think about getting the right input on. And well-supported laboratories, my last point uh, is that we really need, if, you're, if you wanna help your laboratories, and we'll have, we'll have some, a toxicologist talk here soon, you can, you can ask him questions about it too. Please consider asking them how you can help them uh, improve to their current, to the best standards. There's a great paper out there, as mentioned earlier, uh, that talks about what the, uh, you know, top drugs that we need to be testing for are. Most of our labs would love to be complying with these sort of suggestions, but they need support from different aspects of the community, especially in terms of funding to get there. And that is of utmost, uh, utmost importance to us in developing these pro programs out. Uh, and I'll take any questions, I think. If they'll let me have a question time. Sorry, I talked too long. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll do questions okay. right after we've got all the panel members Great. done. Very good. So, we have to the tension at the very beginning of this is that uh, all of the bios for all of the speakers and presenters will be on our webpage. And Sam, can I announce it? Yeah. Okay. So Sam, the man up here, has really helped us uh, and his team being able to create our nascent.org webpage. Now, I don't want you getting your phones out or your computers. You can watch it after. But uh, we have an entire webpage that will have all of these conference materials. I think, Karen, you mentioned it earlier, but it will be under nascent.org. And all the bios, all the information, and the presentations will all be there. So we're very excited for the rollout for that. This is exciting. So we will uh, go through the speakers. Uh, Kurt Harper will speak. Uh, I will then follow, and then uh, Jennifer Davidson, and then Jamie Derbyshire. So we'll just go in that order, and at the end, then we'll do the, the questions and answers. So, Kurt. So I'm delighted today to talk about a very hot topic, oral fluid testing, uh, which is very popular in the toxicology world, but even outside of that in terms of traffic safety. And what I want to do is really distinguish between two aspects of oral fluid testing, roadside screening versus confirmation or laboratory testing. So this is probably, in my opinion, the most important slide, which tries to distinguish between those two areas. So it's important to remember that a state may validate and approve either one of these components or both. For example, a state may decide to validate and approve roadside oral fluid testing for law enforcement, um, but not necessarily confirmation testing using an oral fluid specimen. So on the left, uh, you can see, um, I have pictured actually the Draeger drug test 5000 device. Uh, there are numerous uh, oral fluid roadside screening devices available. In fact, at least two are, are outside the doors behind you and Toximeter and Draeger have units available for you to look at. But these are, are devices uh, designed for law enforcement to use at the roadside to establish probable cause. So they're non-evidentiary in that sense. And they're very similar to a PBT for alcohol. So a lot of times when I'm speaking about roadside devices, I, I state that these are analogous to a PBT or these are a PBT for drugs. The intent there is to establish favorable, further probable cause in the officer's investigation. We'll talk more about the sequence of when these tests should be conducted in the next slide. Um, so on the left, you have the roadside testing. Um, on the right, the second aspect that a, that a state may explore or a laboratory may explore is confirmation testing using an oral fluid sample. So traditionally, the most common specimen in DUI investigations is a blood sample. Uh, some states are still urine states. That is a very poor specimen for DUI testing. However, oral fluid mimics a lot of the advantages of blood um, in terms of identifying the pharmacologically active substance or the parent compound such as THC or cocaine as opposed to carboxy-THC or benzoecanine, which are inactive metabolites may, which may stay in the body for several days or up to weeks after use. Uh, so oral fluid testing uh, from the confirmation standpoint, let me back up, um, will use technology such as mass spectrometry to, identi to positively identify those substances in the oral fluid sample, which will then be issued on the toxicology report back to law enforcement, which may be used as evidence in court. Um, in the state of Alabama, uh, we were the first state to validate oral fluid testing and confirmation specimens and develop a comprehensive program where we have approved roadside oral fluid devices 
but also now with each biological specimen kit that an officer uses to collect a DUI case, it now has blood and oral fluid in that kit. So they're collecting blood and oral fluid in all of our DUI cases for laboratory analysis. <clears throat> I thought it would be a good opportunity to highlight uh, one of the initiatives sponsored by AAA. And in fact, myself, uh, Christine Moore, uh, Jennifer Knudsen, and Bill Lindsay um, were involved in this project. So we had two TSRPs, one from Alabama, one from Colorado, and two toxicologists, as well as uh, Jake Nelson with AAA um, that contributed to developing an infographics document. And this is a, a snapshot of just that. Um, you can access that document at this website link. Uh, but we tried to, to, to provide some valuable information to toxicologists, law enforcement, prosecutors in a two-page summary document. And you can see that we highlight several aspects. In the middle are states that are approved to conduct oral fluid testing. And that may be, again, either roadside testing or a specimen approved in their implied consent statute for laboratory testing. So in terms of challenges, this is actually the very first challenge. If a state is looking to implement oral fluid testing, they need to see if that is permitted by their state. If not, then they need to push for some legislation that will allow for that. We were fortunate in the state of Alabama that our DUI code allowed for blood, breath, or other, other bodily substance, which allowed us to go ahead and initiate our validation for that specimen type. Uh, more and more states are being approved uh, through either uh, bills that have, that have been enacted for oral fluid testing. Some states that, that currently don't allow for oral fluid testing are, are being proactive in validating methods or evaluating devices in the hopes that when their state is permitted to do oral fluid testing, they're already ahead of the game. So there is some progress being made in that area. <clears throat> Above the uh, United States map there, uh, we also wanted to highlight when in the particular stage of DUI investigation these various samples should be collected. So there are three aspects of a DUI investigation. One, vehicle in motion, so why was the individual pulled over to begin with? Two, personal contact, so that's the officer's initial contact with the subject, gives them opportunity to document any behavior that may be consistent with drug use, perhaps identify drug paraphernalia in the car, and then third, standardized field sobriety tests. So HGN, one leg stand and walk and turn. And it's only after those three aspects of the investigation have been conducted that either a PBT for alcohol or an oral fluid roadside test should be given, right? That's the proper sequence. Again, that's to establish further probable cause uh, to collect an evidentiary sample and arrest the individual. So this is really giving ammunition to an officer. And I think these are great uh, devices, even in rural areas, to call up a judge in the middle of the night and say, look, I got evidence that this individual is impaired based on my field sobriety test. They now have screened positive with a roadside oral fluid test for cocaine. I need a search warrant now to collect a blood and or oral fluid sample that will be sent to the forensic toxicology laboratory. <clears throat> so it's important to distinguish between those two aspects and when those samples should be collected because an evidentiary sample is collected post arrest. Now, one of the huge advantages, we have the advantages listed for the roadside screen devices at the top left, and then below that, the advantages of oral fluid laboratory testing. In my opinion, one of the major advantages of oral fluid as a laboratory specimen is the ability to collect that confirmation specimen at the roadside, which is a huge benefit. In toxicology, typically, the average time between the arrest and a blood draw is approximately two hours. It takes time for the officer to transport that individual to the hospital, uh, find a phlebotomist or nurse to collect that sample. Um, during that time period, what is happening to those THC concentrations? Are they typically going up or down, right? They're going down and, and often quite rapidly. Same thing with cocaine, extremely short half-lives. With oral fluid being able to be collected at the roadside, you optimi optimize your opportunity to detect that pharmacolo pharmacologically active component that is likely causing that impairment. So it's a huge benefit. Also, just in general, as an oral fluid uh, specimen is non-invasive. Uh, these tests, either the roadside test or the um, laboratory 
uh, collections typically are very quick, three to 10 minutes to collect a sample. Um, so those are some of the major advantages there. So I encourage you to look at that document um, and, uh, and add that to your resource lab library. In addition to that, with the same sponsored initiative, uh, we are working on a more comprehensive document, a toolkit or a primer um, that's designed to provide uh, the basics and cha anticipated challenges of oral fluid testing for prosecutors law enforcement and toxicologists. And it's our hope to be able to release that um, perhaps as early as September. So stay tuned for that. I thought I would conclude with uh, a case study. This is one of our DUI cases. I'm gonna make this quick. Uh, this is a 24 year old white male. He actually drove off the roadway and into a, a chain link fence. Time of the crash was 10, 10 p.m. Uh, DRE evaluation in this case was one and a half hours post crash. During that time, prior to the DRE evaluation, the officer collected the oral fluid sample. So not quite at the roadside as we advocate, but, but as soon as possible. <clears throat> the blood sample, as in many crashes, took nearly three hours to collect. In this case, uh, the officer screened the individual at the roadside using an Abbott Sotoxa, and they screened positive for THC, stimulants, benzos, and opiates. So that person was having a really good time prior to this. Uh, poly, poly drug use case, these are very, very common. The DRE evaluation identified cannabis and CNS stimulants as the drug category. <clears throat> Let's look at the toxicology. Again, blood three hours post, post crash, oral fluid about hour and a half. Um, we tested for THC in the blood, none detected. Cocaine in the blood, none detected. However, we detected 315 nanograms per milliliter of THC in the oral fluid, 66 nanograms per milliliter of cocaine in the oral fluid. So with that sample of oral fluid, not only being, being collected closer to the driving incident, but knowing that the concentrations are actually quite high in the oral fluid. A lot of these ratios are three to one, two to one, in terms of their concentration compared to oral fluid to blood. So a positive greater than one uh, ratio. Uh, we were able to detect those substances, which is often a reflection of recent use. We should look at toxicology, not in isolation, but with the totality of the DUI investigation. Um, just along the lines to illustrate the poly drug use, we also detected methamphetamine, very high concentrations in both the oral fluid, greater than 1,000, and the blood, 560. Uh, we detected alprazolam, which is Xanax, the most common anxiety medication, greater than 1,400 in the oral fluid, 150 nanograms per milliliter in the blood. Um, so this highlights just as an example case study of the utility and some of the advantages of oral fluid testing where if we had blood alone, we would have missed those pharmacologically active substances. And it would have greatly limited my testimony as a toxicologist uh, because with that information alone, uh, those metabolites can actually stay in the blood for several days. <clears throat> And I'll finish just by showing overall THC prevalence um, is quite high in our oral fluid cases. We have a 93% positivity in oral fluid compared to 81% in blood. Uh, this is even more pronounced if we look at our cocaine. It's about an 85 to 90% prevalence in oral fluid uh, compared to about a 20% prevalence in blood. Um, you can also see the median concentration differences so the concentrations in oral fluid are high. Um, and they're gonna be higher as you collect that sample closer to the driving. Uh, 25 nanograms per milliliter of THC in the oral fluid versus four uh, nanograms per milliliter in the blood. <clears throat> and with that, I'll conclude. Um, I'm gonna skip over this last case study. I'll just mention that we're also starting to explore oral fluid testing in postmortem cases to include traffic fatalities. So that's something that we're working on in our laboratory as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, customarily the uh, moderator is not a speaker in a session. Uh, we had to make just a slight change, so I get to do this special session on the electronic search warrants. You know, as Kurt Harper was alluding to, you know, this allowing for oral fluid allows for the officers to be able to make that next step. And oftentimes, you know, back in the old days, how long would it take you to get a search warrant? 
hours. How many judges had to be waking up at 2, 3, 4 in the morning with the DUI at their house with the suspect in the back of the patrol car? Yeah. So, you know, having being able to see technology and how that can advance and how we can move this along, especially in these cases where you are seeing fleeting evidence so quickly, and how do you get that, uh, that search warrant uh, much quicker, especially in some of the, uh, the environment that we're in. So, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit about why are e-warrants important to multi-substance. I think that goes without question, uh, really. And then what are the greatest challenges related to e-warrants to multi-substance impaired driving? And then what are your thoughts on how best to meet the challenges you've described? So I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Some of this, um, where's Mike Hansen? Thank you very much for uh, your folks for allowing me to steal some of their information. So, yes, um, I always knew that if you cited your sources, you were okay. So, first of all, just to share a few things here with you. These were some of the examples from, uh, I think, when Minnesota, you were putting uh, some of your programs together there. But really what uh, you know, kind of drove some of this, too, and, you know, for our attorneys in the room and for officers, there's several key cases that have really pushed for us to have, uh, have search warrants for uh, DOI blood cases. From Missouri and McNeely, we have Missouri represented here. We have Birchfield versus North Dakota. Do we have anybody from North Dakota here? I know we have South Dakota. Uh, and then Mitchell versus Wisconsin. And we do have some Wisconsinites, so thank you very much. So these three cases, I think, were also helping us to understand the importance of and being able to obtain these types of evidentiary issues. So some of it we just talked about, traditional paper search warrants take a lot of time to prepare, and then being able to go to like the judge's home or someone to get a signature. Um, some now that we've seen are uh, local email processes where the court and the officers have created an email system. That's not necessarily ideal, but it's something that's helped them to, to expedite these warrants. And I guess for that, how efficient are those? Are they very efficient? Yes, no. This is part of the audience participation part. Yes, <laughs> yes very. So, so some of those things, you know, we saw the challenges. When I was in Washington State, we saw this was a, you know, was a huge challenge. Uh, look, I think what happens is oftentimes you find a way to make things happen regardless. We tried to get uh, an electronic search warrant system, and we had, I we have 39 counties in Washington State, and what, did, what was the biggest problem we had, Shelley? We couldn't get all of the counties to agree. No, they wanted the signature block over here. No, it had to be over here. We had to have this, you know. And so it was very challenging. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, what are you trying to accomplish? And that was trying to help uh, expedite this process. Um, you know, we also, some judges were meeting some of the officers at restaurants so that they weren't going to their home, um, you know, at, at these times of, you know, they didn't want the suspect to know where they lived anyway. But uh, some of these drivers would drive to lo different locations to really get the signatures for these warrants. Did anybody ever have that happen? Leo, is that you? Yeah. I can see you driving out to the, the, the 15th tee and, sir, can you sign this warrant? <laughs> see? See, there you go. See, there's, that's part of this, the, the challenges that we have, yeah. And then you think about some of the larger counties or even rural communities where it may take a lot more time to drive and be able to, to address it. So these are some of those challenges that I think you're facing. I think in Nevada, you have some of that, you were talking about 65% of the land mass with 2% of the population. You know, how does an officer get on a search warrant from, uh, from somebody if they're not doing an electronic? You know, could they do a telephonic search warrant or is it electronic through some type of a system? You know, and then you talk about small agencies uh, had to leave the city to drive away. So was the city not having officers in that because they had to drive to the county seat to get a search, you know, a signature, so on and so forth. So, you know, what we found is that it often took several hours. And how many of you have states, uh, statutes that you have, you know, the uh, collection of evidence within two hours of driving? Yeah. And so that almost, you know, in some cases, it's like, I can't even get a search warrant. So, so those, uh, I think, were some of the significant challenges of what you look at, but yet, how do we actually help overcome those? Now, 
Responsibility.org with a group of, uh, I think several of you here in the room, um, with the National Sheriff's uh, Association and one other group I cannot read at the very bottom, the Justice Management Institute, came together to look at, you know, for helping states identifying a guide to implementing electronic search warrants. Because it's not just about creating the search warrant in an electronic system, it's then how much is it going to cost? How are you going to manage that? Who will manage it? Will it be a statewide system? Now, I think Minnesota, you created your own system there, which is now, I think, integrated so that even though you get the warrant, that can, can you do a return of service back to the, to the courts electronically, or do you have to man, hand back? That's up to records to handle that from the follow-up, and everything else is all back again. The arrest report for the warrant, the everything else is handled back to the state file. All automatic, yeah. And, and to me, that was like, I know Shelly's just smiling. She's like, we know, Darren. That was like the dream. So, but those are systems that are in place. And how many of you have those systems in your, your agencies or in your state? Yeah. Very few hands that, uh, that have gone up uh, in this room. But yet we're seeing some better and better systems coming along, especially now we have electronic ticketing, electronic, uh, um, let me make sure I didn't say the A word, collision reports. Um, and all these other systems and how those can be integrated. So this was one of the guides that helps uh, to do that. Now, I will also share with you the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration also just came out with a new publication this year on practices for implementing expedited search warrants uh, programs for obtaining evidence from paired drivers. So um, just another little cue for NHTSA. So, but, but these are some key areas that I think that you have to look at if, of why are these so important? I think we've kind of listed out a number of them, but this saves a lot of time and a lot of effort. And when we looked at how much time it was taking to actually do a blood, I'm sorry, a breath test, in Washington State it was about 139 minutes to process a DUI for breath on the average. Then when we looked at blood, it was like 240. And you can say, well, that was well over your 120. But the, the challenge, though, that you had is, is, is how do you you know, create that. So either through state highway safety, traffic records monies, or there are things that can be help, able to help build some of that. But this saves time and money, allows qu officers to quickly return back to the road, because oftentimes these DUI cases take so long that our um, executives saying, you know, don't really focus on those DUIs, try to pass them off to the trooper or whatever, um, because it does take too long and they don't have enough officers either in, in service or in the, in the county or whatever. I had a, a sheriff tell me, he says, Darren, I'd love to do more DOI. He says, but I have 1,800 square miles and two office, or two deputies to cover that. You know, so I mean, the realities are there and that's a huge uh, issue to address. Then um, assisting with successful prosecution. Do you love seeing search warrants with all of your cases and blood? No? We love the evidence. Uh huh. But if a judge signs it, what's you know? Is anybody to challenge that? Okay. Oh, don't. I only have five minutes. So. <laughs> so other areas here that really focus on that, and I and I and I. Uh, I have, I'll share this with you, it's just uh, maybe the screen's a little blurry on this particular screen, but really having a system that allows for the officer's information to be already in there. It's default and it's printed into that information. You can put in your probable cause based on the, uh, the incident, the information, officer's training for your affidavit, then your search warrant, and moving through. So there's a lot of good information that can be done. Um, how long does it take? To get a warrant, uh, as they were looking at these, for the officer, it was taking up to eight minutes. Judges were returning them in about four, because judges can read a lot faster than the officers can type, so <laughs> typically. So, but you see these, and these are even at these AM hours, and so good, uh, these are just information to be looking at uh, to explore and understand. I'm, I'm going to go back to just for one second. But we do see that this is that next step. It's a logical step. Uh, for the DUI process is being able to have the officers being able to obtain those search warrants in a timely fashion so that they can then obtain the, uh, the evidence that they need, which we'll be talking to now with Jennifer Davidson. But before she comes up, I, I just want to just reiterate some things that were shared here a minute ago 
was on the fact that when we start getting, in, in Washington State in about 2009, we, were, we did about 4,500 blood tests that year for DUI. Soon after, for, um, after legalization, I think in 2020, they were close to 13,000 blood tests. So as you equip, like I was saying earlier, as you equip and you prepare and you get these things in place, do you have an infrastructure down the road to handle all of those, uh, that new evidence? So, so, but I'm excited about this next one because this is like near and dear to my heart. Um, and that is law enforcement phlebotomy. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Jennifer Davidson. Good afternoon, can everyone hear me? Okay, good, good afternoon. So good to be here in person after 15 months of being at home. And I'm amazed at the amount of life-saving work that all of you have been able to continue to do in a virtual environment. So thank you for the lives that you're saving and keeping our roads and communities safe. Um, we value the partnerships that we have here. And I'm just thrilled that we're finally stepping back into an in-person environment to continue that great work. Um, as Darren mentioned, I'm going to be talking about law enforcement phlebotomy. I too am very excited about this. This is a great way to help expedite the collection of that critical blood evidence in impaired driving cases um, and is a, a great solution to a lot of challenges that we're seeing. My name is Jennifer Davidson and I'm a highway safety specialist at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration where our mission is to save lives, prevent injuries, and reduce economic costs related to road traffic crashes. And we really do that by conducting research um, through education, the setting of safety standards, and enforcement activity. And this has actually been involved in um, efforts to help reduce impaired driving for decades now. And we've been working with states and local communities and our partners to help conduct research, support promising practices, develop programs, and continue these important conversations. So impaired driving has been near and dear to our heart, and we value the partnerships that we have with all of you in helping to move this issue forward. So we've talked a lot about the numbers today, and I want to remind us in 2019, according to the Fatality Analysis Reporting System, we had 36,096 traffic fatalities. This was a 2% decrease in our fatalities from the 2018 numbers. So we were starting to move in the right direction. Our impaired driving fatalities totaled 10,142 deaths, making up 28% of the overall fatalities. And this was a 5.3% reduction in our impaired driving fatalities over the prior year. Now we saw the 2020 estimates, the early estimate for 2020. Those numbers are moving in the wrong direction. Um, I also wanted to share with you some concerning information um, and some resources that are available for you regarding alcohol and drug prevalence and use. We did release a special report, the examination of the traffic safety environment during the second quarter of 2020. We also released an update to that special report, um, which focuses on the third quarter data and more recently just released our fourth quarter data. So that special report and those two updates contain some really relevant um, information regarding risk factors that we started to see emerging in 2020 during COVID and is really helping to drive the bus on um, some of the fatality numbers that are emerging. So if you haven't seen the special report and the, the updates that have been released, I will share a little bit of what's included in there regarding the impaired driving or um, alcohol and other drug use and prevalence that we are seeing. But I do highly recommend finding these resources on our Rosa P um, repository re website because they do provide information on all of those risk factors that we mentioned about speed, the reduction in seatbelt use, as well as impaired um, prevalence and use. So our traffic fatalities in the first and second quarter of 2020 did go down. But when we started to look at our VMT, we saw a little bit of a concern. And if you look at the second quarter of 2020, our VMT went from 1.10 in the first quarter to 1.42 in the second quarter. 
And we really needed to understand what was happening and why those numbers were going up. So we started to analyze the data by month. And looking at our monthly data, you'll see that on the chart on the left, the 2020 numbers are shown in orange and 2019 numbers are showed in blue. And you'll see that our numbers did go down, but when we started to look at May and June, they started to go up a little bit and this was concerning us. And if you look at the fatality rate in the right-hand column, our 2020 numbers started to skyrocket, particularly starting in April. So when we have something like this occurring, sometimes it's helpful to look back, um, look back and see what happened in the past and see if we can draw some conclusions or maybe have some guidance on how things should look and what we might be able to do to help understand the problem. And in a normal recession, you'll see that VMT will be down and unemployment numbers are down where alcohol or unemployment numbers are up. And you'll see that alcohol and other risk factors are generally down during that time. People may have less expendable income, they may not be traveling as much. So you'll see that alcohol and risk factors are normally down. And as a result, those fatality numbers are also down. But when looking back at this historical um, landscape, we found that the second quarter of 2020 was not behaving that way at all. We did see our VMT was down while our unemployment numbers were up, but we have evidence of alcohol and other risk factors being way up while our fatalities remained flat. So it really was a special circumstance and things were not behaving as we could predict. We also know during that time, and we've talked about it a little bit today, we know that VMT did drop. Um, you'll see a little bit around April and May and June, about a third of our population started to reemerge from stay at home orders. And this could have been our essential workers, our, our law enforcement, our EMTs, our medical professionals, food delivery, um, people working in grocery stores. We started to have a little bit of our essential workers emerging from stay at home orders as well as what we can predict um, as part of the risk-taking population that started to drive our numbers up. We also know during that time that enforcement efforts changed. A lot of the speakers before me have been talking about a reduction in DWI arrests. Our, we saw speeding citations go up. We saw seatbelt citations were down. Um, we also heard in conversations with the NHTSA regions and the state highway safety offices that traffic enforcement looked different. In order to keep the public safe and our officers safe and realign duties with things that were needed during the pandemic, um, we know that traffic enforcement looked different and participation in some of those high visibility enforcement mobilization efforts might have been lower. And as a result, we saw, you know, we wanted to see who might be reacting to that lesser um, deterrence and lesser enforcement. And you'll find in that special report and the updates, you'll find specific information related to speeding and seatbelt use. But I did want to share some of the indicators that we saw for alcohol and other drugs that we were able to track other than fatalities. We did see an increase in opioid related EMS calls in the Loxone administration in relation to opioid overdoses, and this was more pronounced in urban areas. We also saw an increase in marijuana sales taxes for states that reported those taxes. They reported as high as a 40% increase in marijuana sales during that time. We know alcohol sales were up and in self reported surveys. 18 to 34 year olds were reporting that they were self medicating during that time as well with alcohol and other drugs. We also have evidence of increase in prevalence of alcohol and other drugs among the um, critically injured road users at the, the five trauma centers, the study that Dr. Christine Moore had mentioned that we just released. There's a lot of really interesting findings from that that we started to see from her slides. So the documented increases in alcohol and other drug use that I mentioned, we know wholesale and retail sales of alcohol were at record levels in May and June of 2020. People were trying to cope. Um, states that reported their marijuana sales 
revenues showed dramatic increases, as I mentioned, up to 40% higher. And you'll see the chart to the left. This is the rate of EMS activ activations um, for naloxone um, administration in relation to potential opioid overdoses. So if you look at that, the green line is our 2020 numbers, which is way over what we were seeing in 2019. And particularly when you get to about the 16th week of the year, starting in April, going into May, those numbers went even higher and that's a concern. So we did have the trauma center study that Dr. Moore had kind of mentioned to you. This is a separate report that can also be found on um, DOT's Rosa P website, and you can find more information, but we did have a study in the field um, at those five trauma centers that we were able to kind of pivot and take a look at what might have been happening. And we started to collect blood samples from September of 2019 all the way through July of 2020. And she shared some of the numbers with you. And prior to mid-March of 2020, we saw 51% of those samples tested positive for alcohol or another drug. But after mid-March of 2020 through July, that number increased to 65% of those samples testing positive for alcohol or another drug. And among those numbers, we saw alcohol go from 21.8 to 28.3%. Cannabinoids went from 20.8% to 32.7%. And opioids jumped up to 13.9%. So I do recommend taking a look at that trauma center study and also the special report in the third quarter and fourth quarter updates, because those, those can give you some good information on what we were looking at um, in 2020 that might be driving some of those numbers up. And I always like to start with the data because it really, it really just shadows the importance of why it is we do the work that we do. And I think therein lies the challenge. There's so much more that we need to know about um, what our numbers and our scope really is. And, um, find ways to help expedite the collection of evidence and provide tools to help get us there. One of those is law enforcement phlebotomy programs. And we know that impaired driving enforcement done in a fair and equi equitable way is critical in getting our impaired drivers off of the roadway. And we know that this is a great way to not only remove people from the roadway, but also to match them with important services like screening and treatment if warranted and technology that can prevent impaired driving down the road. And law enforcement phlebotomy programs are a great solution to help with the time and cost associated with collecting blood evidence and is another great training resource available for law enforcement. So they are, law enforcement phlebotomy programs allow law enforcement officers who have specialized training in phlebotomy to draw blood for investigative purposes and it allows for the collection of the chemical te testing evidence in a timely and efficient and a cost uh, effective manner it's a proven strategy to mitigate some of those challenges between time and cost issues and um, help to collect that evidence we currently have 12 states that have active law enforcement phlebotomy programs, and the hope is that this can grow because it can expedite the time or lessen the amount of time in order to collect that important blood evidence for impaired driving cases. We additionally, I don't know if, if many of you saw this, but we're excited to announce we did offer through Toxel, our contractor, we have a task order that is active currently to offer financial assistance and technical support to states and local agencies who are interested in either implementing a new law enforcement phlebotomy program or strengthening an existing program. And we had our first round of applications that went out, which we just closed that call for applications and the review panel has evaluated the applications that they've received and they will be awarding six grants to states to implement new law enforcement phlebotomy programs. So this is incredible because we're currently at 12 law enforcement phlebotomy programs, and now we can be growing that to 18. If anyone is interested in finding out more information on how your agency or your state can apply for technical assistance and 
potential funding to help support the strengthening or implementation of a new program, I'm going to have my contact information on my last slide, um, and you'll have access to that on the, the NASA.org website after as well. Please reach out to me or your local NHTSA regional office, and we can make sure that you're included in the next call for, for applications because we, we are happy to have that resource standing by to help where it can. Another great resource is the Law Enforcement Phlebotomy Toolkit, and this is a guide um, for agencies who are interested in implementing a new law enforcement phlebotomy program. And I know there are a few of you in the room who helped um, put this toolkit together, and we are so grateful for the support and, and input, but the toolkit really does provide kind of a comprehensive look and approach and resources to implementing a, a phlebotomy program and helps think through all of the resources um, that might be needed and also connect you with resources to implement the program. The toolkit contains an overview and kind of an understanding for the need for and also the benefits of establishing a law enforcement phlebotomy program. It includes information on planning and implementing the phlebotomy program, training considerations, um, how to address liability concerns, but not only liability concerns, but also how to obtain buy-in. It's really important and critical in a law enforcement phlebotomy program to make sure that you lay the groundwork to um, obtain buy-in from leadership um, both within agencies and partner agencies and municipalities, but also to help raise awareness among the general population and public. Maybe work with media outlets to, you know, highlight the level of training that these officers receive. In many cases, states have gone above and beyond what's required of medical phlebotomists to have their law enforcement phlebotomists trained to an even higher degree. Um, it will also include barriers and in how to overcome them, costs and cost benefits. Uh, Utah, Highway, Utah State Highway Patrol reported that they saved $30,000 in the first year that they implemented their law enforcement phlebotomy program. So although costs can be you know, incurred through um, establishing the training program, the amount of money that they were saving from doing contract phlebotomy at the local hospital really supported the implementation of their program. So I do highly recommend taking a look at this toolkit and please reach out if you're interested in being include, included in the second round of applications for financial support. So thank you. All right, uh, last but not least in our panel, I'm Officer Jamie Derbyshire. Um, I work for Montgomery County Police. So those of you who are local are familiar with where that is, but we are uh, Porter, Washington, DC, fairly large county and um, I've been with them for about 20 years and the majority of my career has been in, in traffic enforcement. So uh, traffic safety, highway safety is extremely near and dear to me as well. Um, I'm here to talk to you all about cannabis impairment detection workshops, also known as Green Labs. So um, I, I wanna go over a little bit sort of how we uh, came up with this idea and sort of um, how we implemented it and why and the problems that we saw and then sort of uh, some things that I've learned through doing a number of these for a couple of years now. So one of the things that, that we saw, and, and I'll make this brief since I'm limited on time, but essentially in Maryland, just to give you a little bit of background for those of you who are Marylanders, um, we have had a medicinal cannabis program for a long time, since 2014, but we didn't have dispensaries legally allowed to open until December of 2017. So, um, and it was a slow process. We had 102 dispensaries or companies that were actually granted licenses in order to open these dispensaries. Um, and we still haven't, I think they have actually more than 102 open now because some companies have multiple locations. Um, but technically our program is still in its infancy. Um, the last uh, data that I got as far as certified patients, medical cannabis patients in the state of Maryland is a little over 126,000, but those were late January stats with regard to certified patients. So, um, and I, I say this not because I'm concerned about the medical cannabis patients driving um, impaired, that's not at all the case. Many of them are responsible users and, and they're not the ones necessarily that we always worry about. Um, but just to give you an idea as to how much cannabis is out there, how much more is out there just because now we've increased legality of this product. And you know, there is that acknowledgement uh, that yes, it does impair one's driving ability. Um, Montgomery County, to give you a little background on Montgomery County, we have about a million residents. Um, it's a very transient county, as you can imagine, in Washington, you know, being so close to Washington, D.C., 
I have a ton of traffic. Pretty much it seems like all the time. I'm always shocked when I go out west and uh, the traffic is so light later in the night because it doesn't ever seem to really die that much around here. Um, another thing is when you're thinking about cannabis and driving, and I think it's been mentioned a few times today, is just that dissipation rate of THC isn't conducive to the length of a collision investigation. So when we get officers out there and they're investigating potentially you know, an impaired driver and it, a collision was a result of that impaired driving, um, you know, that dissipation rate of THC is, is very quick. And so by the time you're actually on scene and you're speaking to the individuals that are involved and you get other officers out there and you're running through the field sobriety test and you take them back to the station and do a breath test, it's a long length of time. And so that dissipation rate for THC um, is not really conducive to being able to say, yes, that's the contributing factor for these accidents. Um, and then also the peak effects of cannabis is limited in time. So when we're talking about cannabis, especially for frequent versus occasional users, um, their impairment and the impairment that's visible as a general indicator of cannabis use is, is limited, um, you know, to a couple of hours. So by the time, you know, you get a, a drug or cognition expert there to evaluate the person, a lot of those general indicators that may have been present at the time of the collision are no longer there. And then another thing that we notice as the problem is that officers are aware of alcohol impairment general indicators, but cannabis is a little bit different. When we're teaching the rookies at the academy, we stress, you know, horizontal gaze and stagnus. We talk about that so often that a lot of officers become reliant on just that, just seeing that HGN and thinking, okay, I have impairment and I know I have impairment and I'm good to go because we talk about how um, indicative it is of impairment, but alcohol impairment. So a lot of people, a lot of officers say, well, you know, I thought HGN was always supposed to be there and it's not going to be there for cannabis. So it's something we needed to be able to train our officers a little bit better. And a lot of this all came down to training. Um, is that we need to be able to train them a little bit better to recognize general indicators of cannabis, considering that the amounts out there are increasing and we're gonna be seeing more people driving under the influence of cannabis. And in Maryland, we have, our numbers have increased and um, it seems to be uh, pretty consistent across the, the nation as they start to legalize and those, uh, that legislation gets a little bit um, you know, more lenient with regard to cannabis. So just to give you an idea of Maryland, this is um, an attestation form, which is what medical cannabis patients sign uh, when they first go into a dispensary and they, they purchase product. And so there is recognition uh, in that community that it does, uh, that cannabis does impair. It impairs one's ability to operate a motor vehicle safely. And when they're signing this, they're saying that they recognize that um, and that, that you know, there are consequences for those actions. So we're getting somewhere in the fact that we say, yes, um, we know that it impairs one's ability to drive safely. Um, and so it's nice that that sort of seems to be a general message that is being delivered, not just in the law enforcement community or the general public, but in the cannabis community as well. So with this problem, uh, I think it, at the end of 2000, maybe mid 2018, I went to our chief and I said, hey, we really need to come up with a solution for this because with a lot of the dispensaries that are opening and more cannabis in our, our state and our county, we're probably gonna be seeing more impaired drivers um, and under the influence of cannabis. And so we said, or I said to, uh, to him and our Lieutenant, I think we should bring some, some medical cannabis certified patients in and we'll have them consume and we'll dose them. Similar to the NHTSA wet labs that we rely on for uh, alcohol impairment. Um, we'll dose them twice in, during a set period of time and we'll be able to show our officers, we'll have students come in and we'll have these officers run them through field sobriety tests and some of our A-ride tests in order to recognize impairment at its finest because generally we're in a controlled environment. We're able to have the person you know, consume and then go right to the testing phase. So essentially the duration of effects and the peak effects will be highly visible at that point. And so it's really the best case scenario for training for these officers to be able to see uh, you know, what general impairment looks like under this, this drug. Um, we did three hours of classroom and then a two hours of a lab session. So where the students would run the, um, run the cannabis users through uh, the standardized field sobriety test. Then we do a working dinner and then we did some enforcement afterwards so that they could put what they learned to practical use. Um, so far, we've done about one per quarter. We slowed down a little bit with COVID, but the nice thing is, is we're seeing this trend, this cannabis uh, impairment detection labs, they're growing and they're kind of growing throughout the nation. And we've received really positive insight on far, as far as what this training has, has offered. Um, and the important thing, and one thing that we've noticed um, most is, you know, you need to be able to determine where this is gonna happen. We were lucky and fortunate that we were able to do it at our academy, 
but obviously when you're talking about consumption, that comes into play. The one thing that I need to mention is um, for us personally, because of our state status that we have medicinal users only that are allowed to consume um, and all of our volunteers and consumers are uh, certified medical patients, um, we partner with local dispensaries in order to uh, recruit volunteers to come in and to help us out. Um, one of the amazing things about this is uh, I probably know more medical cannabis patients than I ever imagined I would know. And um, it's a great community who have been extremely enthusiastic and welcoming of this training and very helpful on multiple levels. And I think, um, you know, needless to say, they've gotten a lot out of it as well, which has been good because we're spreading that message, that traffic safety message. Um, so while a lot of them acknowledge that, yes, it impairs while driving, just that little reiteration while they're with us and for them to understand what we're looking for helps as well. Some of our goals of the training, we wanted to teach officers to better recognize cannabis impairment. Uh, we wanted officers to feel more confident with arrest decisions so they weren't going in saying, you know, a lot's changed. So that odor of marijuana or odor of cannabis is no longer just enough to, to go further in your search or your detention or to say that I think someone's impaired, you need more. And so um, we wanted officers to be able to understand that. We wanted to build relationships between law enforcement and the cannabis community. Like I said, the relationships and what we have done with the dispensaries has been great. We've really met a lot of nice people. We have a lot of support, a um, bunch of responsible uh, individuals who, who want to make certain that the, the highways are safe as well um, and, and you know, make certain that accidents aren't occurring because of cannabis usage. Um, again, that controlled learning environment uh, with the gradual increase in impairment was extremely important for us as well. We wanted to also familiarize officers with cannabis legislation, so we didn't want to waste, um, you know, individuals times who had their medical cannabis certification. Um, we wanted officers to be a little bit more familiar with that because a lot of them hadn't received any of that training in, since the academy. And so with that legislation constantly changing when they would make a traffic stop and they could verify that someone was a medical cannabis patient and they weren't impaired, then it makes that interaction so much easier the individual is allowed to drive away. He's sober or she's sober and the officer can go back to doing other things as well. So it's saving time on all ends. And then we wanted to introduce officers to available roadside tools for the future. So um, one thing that we incorporated into these labs and it keeps changing, it keeps altering the labs a little bit as we go along just with new things, but we introduced oral fluid testing as well to these labs. So essentially similar to the wet labs where um, you would have alcohol and you PBT or you offer them a preliminary breath test when they come in to make certain that they're um, there's no alcohol on board prior to beginning the, the wet labs. We have oral fluid tests that we use in order to, um, to make certain that they have more or less abstained from cannabis prior to coming to our labs so that we know that they're essentially sober from the get-go. So it's been neat to allow our officers to be able to see oral fluid testing and to talk about how that could be used as a screening device for our department in the future. So some future action items uh, to consider. With all of these labs, um, I like the research part of it. I like to um, take notes on, on our standardized field sobriety test and what is seen with each individual that we bring in. Um, so I know that there was mention about cannabis specific roadside test may be not being the best to teach or to try to train our new officers with, you know, and having them be able to differentiate between which tests are needed and which aren't. But I do think that there are probably more roadside tests that uh, could be developed that would, you know, allude to cannabis use as opposed to just alcohol use. I do think that there's a, a place for that. Um, another thing is research consistent to adjusted product THC levels. And I say this because I think this is really important that a lot of people um, don't think about as often. But um, when we have our users, our consumers come in, we tell them we don't want them to get extremely high. We want them to use what they normally use and they'll dose twice um, fairly close to, to one another. And so with regard to that, a lot of our consumers are bringing in, I would say, 30% uh, to 83% THC content for the concentrates. And these guys are tolerant users, they're frequent users, they use often. And you know, some of them are not showing that much impairment on our standardized field sobriety tests. So when you think about some of our federal research and some research that is done elsewhere, you know, and the levels that they're using for THC content in those studies, it's very different from what we're actually seeing these individuals using on a regular basis. Um, another thing that I found to be useful is law enforcement and research group partnerships. So we actually partnered with Morgan State University and they actually bring their driving simulator to a lot of our labs. And so they will have our volunteers run through a baseline test actually through the street of uh, downtown Baltimore. And um, 
and then they'll bring them back after they've dosed for the second time to see, um, you know, what uh, differences they've noticed. And so they measure, um, you know, breaking ability, reaction time, a few other things that we know, um, you know, could be compromised by cannabis use. But it's been really enlightening with regard to that. Um, and then, like I may mention, oral fluid as a roadside screening device, um, I think we need to incorporate more of it. I think we should definitely consider that, um, you know, carefully with within our departments and just to help our officers have that one extra tool, that screening device that would be helpful. And then and most importantly as well, I think we need to increase the number of cannabis impairment detection workshops. And we've seen that. We've seen it happen as these states start to legalize. A lot of people have reached out and said, hey, we need to do these. We need to get our officers involved. Um, in that one corner, you can see is a guide that was recently put out by responsibility.org and Joanne Tomka's people. Um, they got a few of our, the SMEs together and we came up with this guide to help other agencies put on these workshops. <laughs> and a, a lot of used them, even in the state of Maryland, we actually have increased the number that we've done, not just in Montgomery County, but statewide as well. So again, those guides are out there and I believe they're on your website right there on responsibility.org. Yeah, they'll be on responsibility.org and then they'll be uh, over on to nasid.org as well. And I'll just say for the cannabis impairment detection workshop, why don't you tell them what Maryland State Police just did? Well, they recently just put one on, and but um, and even though I'm in the state and a resource, they pretty much did it all based on that that guide alone. So with very few additional questions. So it's great. It addresses certain loopholes, uh, problem areas, things to consider, um, and they really asked very little of me, very few questions, and they went on that guide alone. So um, it's great, and I know that other states are starting to look at it as well, and um, and it's been very useful as a whole. And my contact information is on there as well. If anyone has any further questions, I'm always happy to talk about cannabis detection workshops or anything of that matter. But um, I appreciate your time and thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, thank you again to our panel members. And I would like now to turn some time to you as audience members. Uh, it's for any questions for uh, Matt Myers, Kurt Harper, Jennifer Davidson, Jamie, and it was in that order. So, not that they're sitting in that order now, but uh, please, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this uh, question is for Kurt. Uh, did you find the cases you were talking about the sequence in which the oral fluid test was being used? Uh, did you find uh, cases being thrown out across the state for officers being used or using them out of sequence? Uh, for instance, if you have a driver that won't submit to um, SFSTs or a DRE screen. So that. That probably would not reach me as a toxicologist. That would probably be handled bef before the case actually reached my stage. Um, and Bill Lindsay behind you, our TSRP may be able to comment on that specific question. We do really focus on providing proper training to our law enforcement, either through A-Ride or DRE school um, on the proper sequence of when to take, take a test or when to collect a sample. Uh, so we haven't had that specific instance yet. Um, in fact, what we've seen with oral fluid testing, which was not entirely expected, or maybe to the, to the degree, is the consent is very, very high for oral fluid. In fact, a lot of, they will volunteer to give an oral fluid sample before they will a blood sample. So we have seen about 10% of our cases, although we advocate collecting both oral fluid and blood, that they only collected oral fluid because they didn't go to the next step to get a search warrant to collect the blood. So that's one of the challenges we're dealing with now um, is encouraging officers to collect both those specimens. We're viewing our program that blood is still kind of the key specimen, but we're collecting oral fluid as a supplemental to gain that inf extra information that I highlighted in some of those case studies. In my opinion, both have very similar advantages. And since we were the first program to implement confirmation testing, we took a very conservative approach and advocated collecting both blood and oral fluid. We were not prepared to go to oral fluid testing only for confirmation purposes. Maybe down the road as more and more laboratories collect oral fluid data, that may be a route to some states to choose. But we, we chose to collect both specimens, especially since we were the first program, we want to continue to collect data. But they do offer both uh, similar advantages of detecting the parent or active substance 
Um, and that is a key component of any DUI investigation. But we should also consider the SFSTs, the officer's observations of behavior in a case. From a police point of view, it's, it's for a police point of view, it's great to have, thank you, uh, oral, because we can get it quicker, faster, and if it becomes uh, state law puts in the statute, it be easier for our people. It's just that uh, I didn't know that that was uh, uh, substantially similar or better than blood, and that's something that I'll have to check into. I hope, I hope it's good. Yeah, I would say that if you're looking at concentrations, there are certainly more reference values in blood than oral fluid at this time, um, but both serve a similar advantage of identifying that active substance compared to urine where you're detecting metabolites, which are not gonna be reflective of recent use. We have another question back here. Uh, my question's about oral fluid testing and convictions. Uh, is anyone aware of any published appellate court decision upholding a conviction based either on simple roadside oral fluid testing or roadside oral fluid testing plus confirmation of whatever type at a lab? So there is one case and maybe um, Bill Lindsay can comment on that out of California. Or no, Jim. sir, there are no published I'm over here, sorry. There are no published appellate court decisions yet. And, and mainly because we're, in, we're encouraging people to use those oral fluid that we call the roadside devices for probable cause only and not as evidence in, you know, toward guilt. But there are none um, from a published appellate court. Yeah, in the case I was referring to, I'm not sure how far it reached in, in California using one of the roadside can, devices. Can I, can I just follow up? Are, are there any where there's the combination of oral fluid roadside and confirmatory blood testing afterwards? No. Oh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much. I've currently testified in six oral fluid confirmation tests. They haven't been heavily challenged and they've all had an accompanying blood sample, but I anticipate in the near future, we're gonna have the first oral fluid only case. So it's just a matter of time. So we did have uh, one question that came in from online that we'd like to, and it says, I'm interested in starting testing, a testing program in my area, where do I start? Um, I, I'm assuming it's oral fluid testing um, for that part. So maybe just a quick, 30 second sounds like. Sure, I would start with, there's a lot of resources on the SOFT, the Society of Forensic Toxicology website. In fact, we have one document, it's a pilot project guideline document for those interested in exploring, validating roadside devices and or validating oral fluid confirmation testing. Uh, the other bit of information I would provide or advice is to involve key stakeholders the DRE program, your traffic safety resource prosecutors, local judges, attorneys, and toxicologists when you design that study. And then lastly, we're in a different position than we were three to five years ago. There's been so many publications on the various roadside devices. There's confirmation methods available. So everyone doesn't have to start from scratch now. Um, they can cite other studies that have answered those key questions and perhaps implement or a validated device based on published literature. I would also, is uh, just as a kind of a build on with uh, Kurt's response, is also make sure that your state highway safety office is involved as well uh, as part of that equation. So, um, any additional questions? Shelly? There we go. Um, so, this question is uh, sorry or Chief Myers. <laughs> I really appreciated your conversation about uh, deterrence and your conversation about asking agencies what they needed. So I guess I'll ask, um, what funding do you need to increase the perception of risk of arrest uh, in your area? Well, that's, that's a tough one, it, you know, especially targeted in right there. You know, and right, right now, there's so many factors to include in that. I mean, honestly, the basic one is I can't hire police officers. You know, I mean, so, so that's a challenge I got to deal with probably more than anything else right now. Uh, so, I mean, the challenge to my deployment of resources, 
uh, right now mainly is the fact that nobody wants to be a police officer. It just is what it is. And so I'm having a hard time staffing from that. Uh, nonetheless, the you know, enforcement of DUI laws and traffic laws maintains a priority, even like during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that, that's something that, that I've always pushed and we continue to prioritize that. Um, you know, so right now, a lot of our logistical challenges in terms of your direct question are not necessarily financial in, uh, unless it's financial and helping me recruit more officers. If we were to tie it more to the training programs and things like that, most of them are, uh, are fairly well funded in terms of the ability to provide the training. It's getting officers to be able to go to the training uh, for one. And uh, my biggest priority, to, I'll just nutshell that, uh, to take it one step further out is uh, not necessarily, it's not always more training, it's more, perhaps more research, more targeted research, making sure that we have a robust program with what we have now and providing more training opportunities to uh, expand upon the, the contingent we already have of certified DREs. So. Thank you. I, I know for Washington, we have trouble, um, you know, we put out a lot of overtime funding to do high visibility enforcement. And right now our return weight is at least 40% of that funding coming back to us unused. Right, yeah, so over, you know, overtime programs are fantastic. And uh, you know, I think in, in terms of, in general, uh, there's probably a lot of areas where that would be uh, you, you know, needed. Uh, and that, that really is gonna vary a lot depending upon the locale, what the state is, what the overtime program is like for that individual agency versus uh, you know, is it, a, is it a state situation? I know a lot of examples of uh, state programs out there that fund overtime grants. It, you know, that, that, that's a great way to do it, to increase the you know, increased deployment. Uh, for me personally, I, I don't have that issue. Um, I, I've got a good overtime budget. I can fund the officers to do it. It's, it's getting officers, you know, just bodies to fill positions personally. Uh, but th those, that is a great resource, the overtime grants. Darren, we have a question from online. Actually, we have two. The first one is from Etika and the Washington Traffic Safety Commission. Etika Escada. Ah, yeah, the one and only. Um, she wants to ask if there are other jurisdictions or courts or highway safety offices that are using oral fluid testing as a way of monitoring offenders. And then after that one, I'll ask the next one. So monitoring offenders like in a probation setting? I believe so. Um, I don't know any specifics, and maybe someone else. Is Mark, where's Mark Stadola? Yeah. New York has some. Um... You know of any, Mark? I'll answer. Okay. Obviously, workplace drug that testing is... is an area where they're starting to now, they've approved oral fluid as a specimen, not the exact same sector as you're referring to, but more and more applications of oral fluid testing are emerging. And so that's a very significant one for, for workplace testing. Brandy, there's a case out in New York. Um, so we do know that some courtrooms are using it there as part of probation. Happy to share that. But I think Great. it could be used in like for probation, parole. I think it could be used for, you know, maybe even some of the, uh, the DUI courts that they have themselves. I mean, if there are other additional factors that you could be utilizing that for as this information comes out not as a determination but it's a screener i think the next step so okay brandy your next question and then i have to cut you off <laughs> the next one is from diana oliver and she asks is there any thought of giving incentives to officers for dre training because she's heard anecdotally that's that it's a it's a tough sell anecdotally that's what Tough that sell. it can be tough to get people interested in doing uh, it. it. It is tough. Uh, it, it's very tough to get people engaged, uh, partially just because of pe people are kind of scared of the class. I, I actually just went through trying to <laughs> trying to talk a couple people into to going, and they're, they're, they're worried about the academic part of it because it is a tough program. Uh, you know, so are there financial incentives? Mostly no. Uh, there's not. Now, there, there are some places there are, and some places it's pretty, uh, you know, they're pretty robust. I'll say the, the few places that there are incentives, for the most part, it's a, you know, a nominal increase, like you get a 2.5% increase in your annual salary for achieving the certification. Um, so there's a few things like that. Some places, I, I believe New Jersey has uh, overtime grants where there's a call out system. And so if you're a DRE and you're in the call out system, you get called out to do an evaluation, uh, you know, you can accumulate a pretty substantial amount of overtime pay doing that. 
uh, and I think some of them are even a flat pay rate that's actually probably higher than the officer's overtime rate if they'll come in from off duty to do evaluations. So there's opportunities uh, like that, but they are not nearly widespread enough, and that, that is a, uh, that would be a great priority, uh, you know, if you can get that uh, in your law enforcement agency. A lot of times getting additional pay incentive type things for like, like that for officers are very challenging. Uh, one of the ways that I have gone about that is I, I, in my agency, there's not a direct DRE pay incentive, but I made that one of the uh, one of the training programs you could complete on what we have what we call a career development program. So uh, we, we do provide different tracks of pay increases, and that is one step in that. I have one more question I want to ask Jamie, and that is. How do you see uh, uh, doing Green Labs, ex or seeing expanding when, uh, if we see federal leg legislation for legalization? Um, I mean, I, I think that as far as our consumers go, it's probably, it will be more, um, I think we'll see more impairment, like I'd said before, with regard to our medical patients, a lot of them are frequent users, and there's definitely a difference between your occasional user and your frequent user. I guess my concerns with that, once it reaches that federal level, if it, um, you know, if it's that uh, across the board legalization similar to alcohol, is if we think about the numbers that were reported today, um, you know, that's over 10,000 deaths in 2019, drunk driving related. Um, you know, you'd have to think that there would be thousands that would be attributed to to cannabis impairment as well, even if there were uh, tons of thousands that were using it responsibly. Um, you know, it would still be a concern, I would think. So I would think that the green labs, we would need to increase them and have, have more of them, uh, but similar structure uh, with regard to that as well, but kind of incorporate them similarly to how we do our alcohol uh, wet labs for NHTSA training. Okay, thank you. And then lastly, this is, I promise this is my last question. Uh, Jennifer, in your slide, you showed that there were, you know, 10 to 11,000 people killed every year in alcohol impaired driving uh, cases. Do those alcohol impaired driving cases in, take, into, take into account if it's just drugs only? Or is that something that if we added that, that number would actually grow? It would grow, and we don't know the full scope of the drug impaired driving problem. Um, many places will test for alcohol if they get the .08. Um, there may not be separate statutes to go any further, and it would be additional cost to test for other drugs. So. Um, the numbers for alcohol that I showed are alcohol only. There are additional for drug. Okay. Would you please allow or join me in thanking our panel for their amazing uh, expertise?